Imagine stepping into a dark prehistoric night, only a fire crackling, casting shadows on a cave wall. Around it, figures not unlike yourself, yet distinctly different, sit watching the flames. You raise your hand, offer a greeting, and speak. Hello, I am friendly. But the faces remain blank. The language, your most human tool, fails. So the question becomes, how far back in time could you go and still be understood? This is not just a sci-fi scenario. It's a journey into who we were, and how the voice in your throat and the thoughts in your head were forged across a million lifetimes. Welcome to the deep past. A traveler steps out of his machine, not into a battlefield or a royal court, but into the quiet flicker of a prehistoric fire. In his hand, he holds no weapon, but a device, an advanced translator capable of decoding the most ancient tongues and gestures. He has crossed eons for one humble question. How do you cook an egg? It sounds simple, almost absurd. But beneath it lies something profound. He isn't just testing his device. He's probing the very roots of human language. Could meaning survive the deep rewind of time? Could a modern mind connect with the earliest sparks of human thought? This isn't science fiction. It's a search for the moment when silence gave way to speech, and the human story truly began. Victorian scholar Friedrich Max Müller once claimed that language marked the great divide between man and beast. Our Rubicon, he called it. But science would soon prove otherwise. In 1861, French physician Paul Broca examined the brain of a man known only as Tan, who had lost nearly all speech but retained full understanding and reasoning. What Broca found was groundbreaking. A lesion in the left frontal lobe, now called Broca's area, the brain's language center. This revelation shattered the old belief that language came from the soul. Instead, it was rooted in flesh and neurons, subject to mutation, pressure, and change. It meant that language, like vision or strength, was an evolutionary trait. And with that, the myth of a hard boundary between man and brute began to crumble. Imagine standing beside a group of early Homo sapiens as they gather around a fire. Would you hear simple grunts, or something more? Fossil evidence gives us a compelling answer. With a descended larynx and a vocal tract shaped for nuance, these early humans possessed the anatomy for true speech. They likely had words, not just sounds, but shared meanings. But their bones whisper more than biology. In graves across ancient landscapes, we find tools, pigments, and ornaments placed with the dead. These are signs of ritual, memory, and belief, of minds shaped by stories. Such symbolic acts point to structured language, the kind that weaves a culture together across generations. Language wasn't just survival. It was identity. Buried deep in our DNA lies a clue to one of humanity's greatest abilities. Speech. It's called the FOXP2 gene, a molecular switch that helps wire the brain for language and vocal control. Modern humans carry a unique version of it one that fine-tunes the motor skills needed for spoken language. In an astonishing experiment, scientists inserted this human variant into mice. The result? The pitch and pattern of their vocalizations changed, proof that one gene can reshape how a creature sounds. And here's where it gets truly fascinating. Neanderthals had it too. That suggests they weren't mute brutes. They may have vocalized meaningfully. So if you ever stood face to face with one, the silence wouldn't be complete. You might hear something familiar. 
Travel back 75,000 years to the wind-swept entrance of Blombos Cave in South Africa, and you'll find something remarkable. Etched pieces of ochre, carefully drilled shell beads, and finely crafted tools. These aren't random objects. They belong to the Still Bay culture, a burst of early human creativity. What makes them extraordinary isn't their beauty, but what they represent, symbolic thought. These artifacts speak of minds capable of abstract meaning, of shared understanding passed down through generations. That requires language, not just sounds, but words tied to memory and ritual. If you spoke to these people today, they wouldn't grasp modern terms like microwave or electricity, but they would understand fire, cut, egg, and perhaps even story, because the roots of meaning were already planted. Go back half a million years, and you'll meet Homo heidelbergensis, not quite us, but far beyond the grunting apes we often imagine. Their skulls and reconstructed vocal tracks reveal something surprising. The capacity to form vowel-like sounds. A, E, and U. Theirs was not fluent speech, but a slurred, drawn-out form of vocalization, shaped by a throat not yet fully modern. Still, it wasn't meaningless noise. These early humans likely used their voices for both urgency and coordination calling out during hunts, warning of predators, perhaps even sharing basic intentions. Communication had begun its climb toward language. These weren't just sounds. They were sounds with purpose. And from purpose comes meaning. Before the first word was ever spoken, there were hands, pointing, waving, shaping meaning in the air. Long before language had sound, it had movement. Even today, babies instinctively babble with their hands, mimicking the ancient rhythm of gesture-based communication. This is no accident. It's a shadow of our evolutionary past. In remote parts of the world, languages still reflect this diversity. In Brazil, some tribes speak entirely in the present, with no past or future tenses. Meanwhile, the barrack of Papua can't say, I drank, without specifying exactly when. These systems aren't primitive. They're sophisticated, adapted to different ways of thinking. They're proof that language has always been more than words. It began in the body, in shared glances, and in motions that meant something real. In a quiet lab, a chimpanzee named Washo learned a sign but she did more than ask for food or play. One day, angry at a caretaker, she strung together two familiar signs, dirty and monkey. It wasn't random. It was an insult, swearing. And for linguists, that was extraordinary. Swearing is complex. It requires emotional nuance, social awareness, and the ability to repurpose language creatively. Our primate cousins may not write poetry or hold debates, but they show flashes of something familiar. Intent. Frustration. Even humor. These moments don't prove full language, but they suggest a shared foundation. The gap between us and them is real, but it may not be as wide as we once thought. Step back nearly four million years and meet Australopithecus afarensis, small, upright, and already reshaping what it meant to be human. She had a hyoid bone, the anchor of vocal sound. But it wasn't shaped like ours. It mirrored that of a chimpanzee, limiting her ability to form complex speech. Still, something important was happening. While full language was out of reach, she may have used sound with structure, perhaps one call for food, another for danger, and a third for come here. This wasn't random noise. It was proto-language, early patterns of meaning bound to survival. Language didn't arrive like lightning. It crept in, built slowly over generations, 
just like bipedalism or tool use. And with every sound, our ancestors stepped closer to something truly human. Deep in the dense jungles of Southeast Asia, a strange silence hangs in the air, until you realize it's not silence at all. The tiny tarsier, a wide-eyed primate no larger than a squirrel, is speaking in a frequency far beyond human hearing. These ultrasonic calls are invisible to our ears, but rich in meaning, used to warn, coordinate, and even court. In our tale, the time traveler's device picks up these whispers, rendering them as pulses of light and lines on a screen. It's not English, and it's not speech, but it is unmistakably communication. These high-pitched signals, refined through evolution, allow tarsiers to stay hidden from predators while still staying connected. They remind us that conversation doesn't always sound familiar, and that language, in some form, may be older and more varied than we've ever imagined. Travel back over 70 million years, and the air is thick with roars, not words. Dinosaurs ruled this world, and while they didn't speak, they likely communicated in ways both subtle and spectacular. Many species had elaborate crests, vibrant feathers, and powerful postures. These weren't just for show, they were visual messages. A flare of color might signal dominance, a bow of the head could signal submission or readiness to mate. Vocalizations existed too. Low, closed mouth bellows like crocodiles, carrying through the swampy air. No grammar, no syntax, but meaning was there, shaped by instinct and biology. This was communication without language, nature's early trial run at exchanging information. In that ancient chorus of movement, sound, and color, we glimpse the roots of something far greater the drive to be understood. The final stop on our journey isn't a campfire or a jungle. It's a tide pool, 3.5 billion years ago. There are no voices, no eyes, no mouths, just molecules drifting through warm, shallow water. Yet even here, something remarkable is happening. Cells begin to respond to chemical gradients, tiny shifts in their environment that trigger movement, reaction, survival. This was communication at its most primitive. Not sound, but signal. Over eons, these molecular whispers became more complex. Patterns turned to codes, codes became symbols, and symbols gave rise to grammar. Eventually, from this ancient chemistry, came stories, cultures, and the voice you're hearing now. Language didn't start with lips and lungs. It began with life itself, reaching out across the silence, saying in its own way, I am here. If our time traveler kept going back, there'd be a point where the translator stops working. Not because there's nothing left to say, but because there's no shared frame to hear it. Yet, even in that silence, there's communication. In the rocks, the bones the smoke of an ancient fire. At prehistoric shadows, we believe the past still speaks. Maybe not in English, maybe not with words, but with echoes, etched in cave walls, buried in DNA, and passed through the structure of our very breath. Every whisper from deep time reminds us. Language didn't arrive. It emerged. Slowly. Messily. Brilliantly. If this journey stirred something in you, a curiosity for where our voices came from, don't stop here. Subscribe to Prehistoric Shadows for more deep dives into human origins, forgotten cousins, and the dark beauty of our evolutionary past. Hit the bell to stay connected with the echoes of deep time.